We'll move on to, however, Owen Flanagan, Professor of Philosophy at Duke, and the author of the really, author of most recently, of the really hard problem, meaning in a material world. Owen. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm especially happy to be one of the five happiest people in this room. <laughs> uh, uh, today, um, I'm just going to, I have three slides, and I'm going to share this time with my colleague uh, from Duke, Guven Gazelder. Um, so since I'm uh, responsible partly for the odd title of this session, and uh, it's kind of fun as an academic to try to plant memes, uh, we'll see how eudaimonics goes. Um, I want to, uh, so I'm just going to talk about two ideas I have, um, and it, it relates to what Anthony Grayling said about living at an interesting and important time, I think, where there is uh, a, um, a chance for the, for the first time in a long time to bring together what I call the intellectually respectable disciplines. I don't include all disciplines among intellectually respectable disciplines, uh, but bring them together and from the more individualistic, say, on the sides of genetics and neuroscience, to such things as anthropology, cross-cultural psychology, and so on, um, together um, to discuss aspects of human flourishing. Uh, but I want to say something about where we're situated, because I've been playing, uh, for my whole intellectual career, I've been interested in the C.P. Snow problem about two cultures. And um, it's the 50th anniversary. I was talking to Cheryl last night. In this May, I actually knew this independently because I gave a talk in Washington last week about the two cultures and the fact that the 50th anniversary of that essay is coming up. So I think, um, so I want to say something about what I talk, what I call neuroexistentialism, which actually I think is uh, my way of thinking about where we are now. So, um, uh, and, and then I'll, I'll end up on the upbeat note. So what is neuroexistentialism? This is my name for um, what I think is uh, one way to diagnose the battle or the, um, the edginess that's been occurring as uh, in the West, but not only in the West, in other cultures too, we try to um, uh, continue to push forward the, role, the idea of enlightenment. Well, what's happened? Well, um, I call this third wave existentialism. Um, at least in my field in philosophy, an important period is thought to occur uh, in the late 19th century when Dostoevsky, Kierkegaard, and Nietzsche come along and suggest that there's a problem with the traditional foundations for the ways we think about the good life, about the good life. So even though Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky, for example, are actually quite religious by our standards, Nietzsche not, Dostoevsky worries about if there is no God, then everything is permitted. And this is a common charge that we continue to see today. If one is not religious, then there's suspicion. And all the conventions of politeness in our culture go towards the theist, not towards the atheist. Um, but um, so this is a, what I call foundational theological anxiety, the kind of notion that, hmm, if there is no God, then how would we justify? Because we've been doing it the other way for so long, our moral codes, our um, aims and aspirations for a good life. Um, then what we get in uh, after the Second World War is a kind of a, hu a generalized human nature angst that we see in people like Sartre and Camus. How is it possible, for example, that democratic and a Christian nation, in the case of Germany, could and, uh, engender um, a holocaust. Uh, and, there, and many people read the ex these er first two ways of existentialism as kind of depressing and nihilistic. Think the idea is that, oh my gosh, if things aren't the way we always thought they were, if we're not as good as we thought we were, if our, if our way of life is not supported by some kind of supernaturalistic grounding, then what are we to do? Now what I call neuroexistentialism, just my name for what you get when you combine the message of Darwin with neuroscience. Now this is, I'm reporting my personal experience um, in teaching both ethics and philosophy of mind for many years. Um, when I approach a philosophy of mind class with my own materialistic, physicalistic, naturalistic convictions, um, uh, that seems to go over okay. That is, when I teach that the mind in some sense is the brain, uh, my modern students seem to be fine with that. When I actually bring it together with the message of Darwin, which you would have thought we were used to since that Darwin wrote the origin in 1859, students get really nervous. What do they get nervous about? They get nervous about the idea that we're animals. This is what I call, what I think is the really destabilizing problem. It makes them nervous. They're not surprised in some sense. They might be dualists or epiphenomenalists still. They're not surprised when the New York Times says, ah, the seed of happiness discovered by Duke scientists. That happened to me actually once in the, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, that was in uh, May of 2003, I think I discovered that. In any case, <laughs> the, um, the, problem, the problem really is that they're not surprised that there are these things that, you know, like did you think it would be nowhere? 
you know, whatever it is that was discovered, it would be nowhere at all. No, they're okay with it being somewhere. But the idea that we're animals, just smarter animals, that more sophisticated animals, but not better than any other animal, different in different ways, this seems to me to be um, a, a problem. Now, uh, the reason I, I, I refer to it in terms of existentialism is, is because I, I do take seriously the idea that, and this came up in a different context with Max Weber in the 19th century, he talked about even the natural sciences as disenchanting the world. And he thought this was a partial problem, okay? The idea was that when we get away with uh, people being sort of punished for, uh, by getting diseases because of bad karma, not that we call that in the West, but the idea was that the, 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 there's a system of rewards and punishments, spirits get into you. No, there's the germ theory of disease, actually. The germs do it. You know, read something like Hans Zinser's great book, Rats, Lice, and History, okay? You know, what makes the world turn a lot of times is just little bugs, okay? <laughs> and good people die young and, old peop and bad people live a long time. Although I saw on that Sonja's slide that the, um, the woman in Arles who lived to be 122 had met uh, Vincent van Gogh. So I think that's the cause of her longevity. Okay, so here's, here's what I think of as the problem. Our problem is how do we harness the successful, truthful insights of these three existentialisms? Because I think they're all got something truthful. The first one has the idea that there are superstitious ways to run your life and there are non-superstitious ways to run your life. And if you un undermine the superstitious ways to run your life, you're left with the problem of figuring out why you're doing what you're doing and what are the good ways to go. The second one is don't trust humans left to their own devices. This is a, a long-term cultural project to make us to politically and personally improve ourselves. It's a complicated task. You can't trust us. You get moral pits if you think that we're born like angels. The last problem, how are we going to adjust to this fact that we are animals, but sophisticated animals? This is, I think, um, one way to look at our problem. So how to harness the successful, truthful insights of these three existentialisms into a liberating and enlightened vision of our problems and our prospects? And I think that's what a group like this has a chance to think through. So this is where I get to what I call eudaimonics in my uh, latest book. Um, so eudaimonia, we already had a very nice um, uh, discussion of this by Anthony. Um, until about 1975, it's my understanding that uh, in America, this was this concept in Aristotle. Aristotle says in the Nicomachean Ethics, he says, I go around Athens asking everybody, what is the summum bonum? Well, he couldn't have asked the summum bonum because that's Latin and he was Greek, but you get the idea. <laughs> what's, the great, what's the thing you all seek more than anything else? And everybody says, eudaimonia. But then he said, when I ask them what they mean by that, they mean different things. Some mean reputation, some mean sex, drugs, rock and roll, some people mean contemplation, and I sort of... And then he says, this is where the expert comes in. Now, people, I think this is important for us, okay? Uh, uh, this is where expertise comes in. It isn't like any old person is entitled to their opinion about any old thing. Sarah Palin is not entitled to opinion about global warming. So two Aristotle things, you don't just ask the person on the street. Why? Because the person on the street is watching that TV show that says the unexamined life on it that Roger showed us. That's where they're getting their feedback. So anyway, eudaimonia was translated for a while as happiness, but in about the mid-70s, I think John Cooper at Princeton said, let's translate it as flourishing fulfillment. One reason is actually Aristotle has this very interesting thing to say. He says, you can't tell whether a person was a eudaimon. My students tease me because I pronounce it like it's French, eudaimon. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> you can't tell if a person is eudaimon until two generations have passed. So it's not subjective. Okay, so he actually wouldn't, so what the kind of work that Sonia does and Diener do is on what's called subjective well-being. Aristotle would say, that's not the prize. That isn't the prize. It's something else, okay? Um, and there's that book, Happiness is Overrated. I own it, I believe in it, but I haven't read it. Uh, okay, so what I call eudaimonics is my name for discipline naturalistic. I emphasize the naturalistic um, inquiry into the causes, conditions, and constituents of eudaimonia. That's sort of, the reason I like it as a foreign word is it doesn't beg the question. I, and what I use in, in my work now is whenever I talk about a conception of eudaimonia, I'll say eudaimonia and superscript it. So I'll say eudaimonia Confucian, eudaimonia Buddhist, eudaimonia this. And I'll say eudaimonia standard brand American, which is happy, happy, joy, joy, click your heels. And I don't think it's very uplifting. Okay. So what are the contributors here? There are all these disciplines, I suggest. Now I'm not going to tell you any of my real ideas, but I'll throw out one. So the, and then I'm going to turn to Guven. 
when people say, well, what is your conception of happiness? Well, first of all, it goes with things Anthony said. I don't think there's like a one-size-fits-all model. I just think there's wisdom out there. And one way I, place I look for wisdom is I do a lot of work in cross-cultural or comparative ethics. So people, for example, are always telling me you can't be happy unless you believe in God. Well, tell the Chinese people that. Um, uh, there's a Chinese, a great tradition that just didn't invent the concept of a creator God or a place that you go afterwards. Um, uh, and um, uh, this is just there for the asking, and people will be more aware and ha know how to criticize certain types of arguments if they look at things cross-culturally. Um, my own view is what I call lately platonic hedonism, um, and um, it goes like this. It's platonic with a small p. Plato famously said, the best way to live is to get back in touch with truth, goodness, and beauty. And those were forms up in Plato's heaven. I don't believe in Plato's heaven. But I think there's something attractive about this. Now, is it right? Is it a way to live? Is it a way for everybody? Probably not for everybody. And here I just throw out a challenge, because I know there's some, both some good friends and some new friends I met, like Sonia, in the audience. I think that we should seek eudaimonia, or at least I like doing it this way, at the intersection of what is true, good, and beautiful. The reason this is actually controversial is because there's a lot of literature in psychology about positive illusions, which says actually that there's a price to be paid for truthfulness. You don't want to think that you'll get prostate cancer if you're a male or breast cancer if you're a woman or get in a car accident or get divorced. Um, I've actually challenged uh, the way that some of this literature is read. But notice, the idea there would be it's good for people to be under certain illusions or delusions because they're happier. In fact, I've been looking recently, and I'll close with this and turn it to Guven. Uh, one area that this comes up all the time is in terms of beliefs that I think that I personally have to fight against supernaturalistic or non-naturalistic beliefs. I think these are dangerous, have proven themselves to be dangerous again and again. Um, recently, I looked up in the psychiatric literature. People always tell me, oh, you should talk to, to um, people in divinity schools more because you're too critical of religion. Well. I do talk to people in divinity schools, and I think that when I talk to them, I'm really unimpressed about uh, what they know um, about um, truth. Um, I think it's interesting the maneuvers they make. Like last Thursday, I was told it used to be that we thought that God created the universe at the beginning, but now we think he's sucking it in from the other side. I said, well, you can say anything you want, but a good university like mine should not pay you to say that kind of stuff. <laughs> so. So here's, here's the concern that um, I think this idea of comforting illusions may be, I'm hoping personally, this is personal, that it's like it's a it's transitional period. As we get three, used to the three, the, the, the truths behind these different forms of existentialism, I think we can progress. I'm hopeful. But I'm not consoled by the fact that all the psychiatric literature that I look up under delusion says a delusion is a belief that you won't give up under any circumstances unless it's a religious belief. And that concerns me. Guven, thank you.